Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 3. And we're going to continue with our, the message we started last week to discuss what is the reason for Israel's water baptism. So this is part two of that message. We covered a lot of passages in order to complete this uh, the uh, discussion about water baptism. It's a subject that a lot of people are interested in. Why did God water baptize the generation that was to go into the kingdom in the, the Lord's earthly ministry? That was the only time in the Bible where water baptism was practiced. And water baptism is, uh, was the first baptizer was John the Baptist. And this passage, Matthew chapter 3, we hear what, John, uh, what John's ministry was about. And, of course, the Lord baptized, the twelve baptized um, and, and with the Lord's ministry. And in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And drop down to verse 6. And they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So there was this baptism that takes place for this generation. So prior to that, under the law, for hundreds of years, they didn't practice water baptism. But there was a, there was a reason this particular generation that was on, the, the, the message wasn't preached, the kingdom of heaven is at hand either, until John the Baptist. So he's heralding the fact that the Messiah was in Israel's midst, and all those prophecies throughout the Old Testament scriptures, spoken about by the mouth of God, all God's holy prophets since the world began, about this time that the Lord Jesus Christ would come and set up the kingdom that had been promised since Abraham, the, the land promised to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant, that they would inherit the land as an everlasting possession, eternal life in this kingdom, that the Lord would come and, and he would deliver, according to Moses, uh, the Lord would replace the law, the old covenant, because of all the curses that had come upon Israel because of the law covenant, he would replace that covenant with a new covenant, and we have two sections in our Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that's, that's the purpose for, for that, with, because the Lord brought in the New Covenant. And we know that at the cross, He shed the blood of the New Covenant. And this particular generation that the Lord ministered to, and John the Baptist introduced to their Messiah in Israel, were water baptized. And there's a reason, there's significance to water baptism for that generation. And there's a reason, and for this reason, uh, it's not significant for the church, the body of Christ, to be water baptized today, because it, the purpose that Israel needed to be water baptized doesn't apply to the church, the body of Christ today. The church, the body of Christ, is baptized and identified with the Lord Jesus Christ the moment they trust the gospel. And we'll talk about more of that. We've talked about that a lot, but we'll talk about more of that. Uh, first, uh, Ephesians 1.13, In whom you also trusted, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, in Christ also, after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of the inheritance, until the... Uh, 14, I'm, I have trouble quoting, so I'm going to go to that passage since I've already quoted. And I want to I make this point about that passage. So Ephesians 1, verse 14, uh, is what I'm going to read here. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So the, the, God the Holy Spirit identifies us with Christ uh, in whom... Also, after you, that you believed, you were sealed. God the Holy Spirit is the, the person of the Godhead, the operation of God, as it's called in uh, Philippians, Colossians, Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to go ahead and go there. Uh, Colossians chapter 2. Uh, the, 
verse 10, and you are complete in him, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. God the Holy Spirit were circumcised in putting off of the body the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's being identified with Christ in his crucifixion. When, when he, his flesh was, uh, w was crucified and his soul and his spirit, uh, he was in the grave for three days and then he was resurrected. We're identified with him in his death, which is how our flesh is circumcised, cut away from our soul and spirit as believers. And notice verse 12, we're buried with him in baptism wherein you are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath, made, who hath raised him from the dead. So God the Holy Spirit, when you trust the gospel, identifies you with Christ, and in Christ you're identified with him uh, in his death, burial, and resurrection. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having what? Forgiven you all trespasses. This isn't taught today in most churches. In most churches, they teach that there's water involved, a water ceremony of water baptism. And that's where you're identified with Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection. But that's not what this verse says. This verse does not mention water. And this, says, this verse says that this baptism is the operation of God. And it's made without hands. So this is what God does when you trust the gospel. That's why you're saved, by trusting that Christ died for your sins. God the Holy Spirit, when he sees that positive response to the call of the gospel message, that Christ died for your sins, trusting that when he died on the cross 2,000 years ago, that he died to pay for your sins. That's salvation. And God the Holy Spirit does the work. It's the work of God to identify you with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how you're made righteous. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the baptism that the Apostle Paul preached. He says there's one baptism. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said uh, that he was... Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I thank God, verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other in that church. Notice verse 17, very important. For Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Paul says in Romans 1 verse 16, I'm not, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The moment you trust the gospel, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. So the way we're baptized into Christ is by the Holy Spirit the moment we trust the gospel. So why was it that John was water baptizing here? It's not to identify those believers with Christ. The water baptism had no efficacious work upon their salvation. And we've been studying this last message, and, and we've uh, been looking at the fact that this water baptism was also a call to repentance for Israel. And so uh, in Matthew chapter 1, we read, read the, um, chapter 3, I'm sorry, we read the verse and, and, uh, a moment ago that he preached... Uh, saying, this is what John was preaching, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was part of the kingdom gospel message that was preached. So when he preached that, uh, verse 6, those that came to his baptism with godly sorrow and true repentance confessing their sins. You remember we looked at the confession. What was Israel's confession here? And we looked at all the passages uh, in recent weeks, recent messages, where the confession was that, that Moses had told Israel, when you're under uh, all the, when you've, uh, under the five, fifth cycle of the curses of the covenant, the old covenant, the law, when you're under that fifth course of judgment and you're scattered as a people out of Israel, you're taken away captive, 
that if you confess and repent, that you're, the reason this has happened to you is because you have forsaken Jehovah. You've turned from God. You haven't kept His covenants. You haven't kept His law, His statutes. Then if you confess and repent, God will see that in the heart of believers and He will have mercy on them and He'll remember the covenant that He made with Abraham and He'll regather them from all the nations that they're scattered into, regather them into the land when He sets up His kingdom under the new covenant. So that's the new covenant. And we talked about that, and you can read it in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 40 through 45. And you can read about it in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 6. That explains why they came to John's baptism confessing their sins. Daniel chapter 9, we looked at Daniel. He was confessing the sins of his nation. That's what they were supposed to be doing at this baptism, not just confessing their own, that they're sinners they're themselves, but confessing as a nation. There's two things going on with the new covenant. It's for the nation of Israel to get restored, gathered in the land and go into the kingdom. And it's going to be for believers in Israel. And it's also going to be the individuals under the new covenant that are uh, given God's grace and made righteous in Christ and so forth. So it's an identification with Christ, but not through this water baptism I want you to see. And I want to ask you a question if you dropped your attention down to verse 7 of Matthew chapter 3. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore what? Fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within your hearts, or say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth fruit, good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now that's a reference to this tribulation period uh, right here that God is going to take Israel through seven years of great tribulation, and that's when uh, th those that d don't have the fruits of repentance are going to be cast into, they're going to be destroyed and burn up with the fire of the tribulation period. Only the believing remnant is going to go into the kingdom. Only believers in Israel, only the seed of Abraham, who are the believers, will be part of the Lord's everlasting kingdom and will receive the land as an everlasting possession. Only believers, and that's important to recognize here. And these Pharisees had come. I want you to hold your place here in Matthew 3 and go to John chapter 8 and look at verse 30. These Pharisees who had come, John rebukes them because they haven't come in repentance and confessing the sins of their nation. They, hadn't come, they weren't coming in true godly sorrow and true repentance. They didn't come recognizing that their nation deserved to have the Roman Empire occupying them and requiring them to, to pay taxes to them. Instead, this is what, speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ, this passage, they're accusing the Lord here. And they're, they're accusing him of not being a legitimate born child. They, they accuse him, uh, verse 41, Ye do the deeds of your father. And they said unto him, we be, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. They're accusing him of not having a legitimate birth. He's the virgin born Messiah for the nation. And they're accusing him of not having a, a father. And so, you know, these, they hate him, they end up crucifying him, but I want you to see what he says, or what they say to the Lord, uh, and, and I want you to start reading with me in, in verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always the things that please him. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and notice, and the truth shall make you free. Now notice what the, the, his cr uh, critics, the religious leaders say to him in verse 33. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? 
And the Lord said, answered them, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. So if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And then he goes on to, to probe them about the fact they are not the children of Abraham because they don't have faith. And read down through the chapter and you'll see that rebuke. So they didn't come saying, we deserve this judgment and we, uh, Israel uh, is in bondage to her enemies and has been since Nebuchadnezzar. But we're, we come confessing that we deserve this judgment from God and looking in repentance to God to restore them under the new covenant. That's not why they were there. They came to see who was responding to John's baptism, and they were watching who the believing, the true believers were in Israel. And if you remember in the Hebrews revelation, during that tribulation period, there are going to be those who spy out those that are true believers, and they're going to turn them into the Antichrist to be persecuted. So that's what's going on here. They're, they're dividing themselves between the apostate nation that follow the Pharisees in the temple and the believing remnant that follow the Lord Jesus Christ eventually. John's introducing their Messiah to them here uh, in chapter 3. So uh, I want you to go to uh, look at the baptism that John the Baptist preached. And that's in John also. Uh, if you, we're going to come back to Matthew 3, but I want you to to see, well, you can drop Matthew 3. Uh, you don't need to hold on to that. If you want to go to John chapter 3, I want you to see the message that John the Baptist preached in John chapter 3. In Matthew 3 it said that John uh, preached, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and those, those that came to his baptism, water baptism, uh, came confessing their sins, right? Uh, John chapter 3, but what was the gospel message John was preaching? In verse 25, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Uh, in verse 23, and John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. John, and for John was not yet, yet cast into prison uh, now, what was the message that John preached? And John answered verse 27. So G John begins talking to his disciples to answer the question about purifying. Isn't that interesting? The baptism is described here as purifying in verse 25. That has to do with ceremonial cleansing. That doesn't have to do with actual cleansing. That has to do with ceremonial cleansing. It's about purification. Verse 26, And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy. Therefore, uh, this my joy therefore is fulfilled. And he must increase, but I must decrease. And so John uh, continues here what he's telling his followers. And he says in verse uh, 33, He that receiveth his testimony has set his seal that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. Now here's the gospel he preached. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That's the gospel of the kingdom that John preached. He preached the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you're a believer, you believe on the, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. The, you remember in, in Matthew chapter 16, uh, the Lord asked the disciples, who do they say that he is? And Peter answers, thou art, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord says, upon this confession, I will build my church. So the gospel that John preached, the way these people got saved, were believing that, uh, that Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God, the, the, that he is um, the one that's going to deliver them from the Old Covenant into the New Covenant, into the uh, Kingdom of God. And so that's the Gospel message that John was preaching. 
But why was he water baptizing? What was the reason? When they believed the gospel, they, they were, when they came confessing their sins, John recognized they had true, true penance and godly sorrow. He water baptized them. That water baptism has a lot of significance. Go to Exodus chapter 19. Now, in Exodus 19, there's a reason that generation uh, needed to be ceremonially ceremonially cleansed. Exodus 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice, this is uh, Moses speaking to the children of Israel before God gave them the law in chapter 20, um, and keep my covenant. This is what God told them to say to them. Uh, Moses say to them, Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And notice verse 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So that generation of people that the Lord is ministering to are going to be the kingdom of priests to the rest of the nations during this tribulation period and then out into this kingdom particularly. Um, go ahead and, and turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 uh, verse 1. Wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Look at verse 1 of chapter 1 with me for uh, real quick. Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Asia, and Bithynia, to the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace be you and peace be multiplied. Peter's writing to the little flock that are scattered through Pontius, these Gentile areas. Okay, He's writing to their strangers, it says, scattered. They're strangers being in the Gentiles' lands. They're not in Israel. They're scattered. Uh, so he goes on, to, he says, uh, as newborn babes desire the, the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 3, if so be that ye have tasted the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, Ye also are lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Spiritual sacrifices, not literal sacrifices, uh, but they're the priesthood, he calls them here. Uh, whereas, uh, verse 6, also is uh, contained in, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion. Israel's mountain, Jerusalem, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, the Messiah, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they are appointed. But, verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now the people of God, which had not, had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So he's talking to this little flock, this group, John the Baptist is, calling them to water baptism. Now go with me to... Uh, Exodus chapter 29. Now we saw this last time. I want you to see this again. Exodus 29. Um, we saw this previously, but I uh, want you to have this in mind. They're a priestly nation, and Exodus chapter 29 is dealing with uh, the, the consecration of priests in Israel. Verse 1, And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, to make them holy. To minister unto me in the priest's office, take one young bullock and two rams without blemish. Verse 4, And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt wash them with water. Uh, look at verse 7. Then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. And thou shalt bring his sons and put the 
put coats upon them, and thou shalt gird them with girdles, Aaron and his sons, and put the bonnets on them, and the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statute, and thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his sons. Look at uh, verse 21. And thou shalt take of the blood of, that is upon the altar, and of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it upon Aaron, and upon his garments, and upon his sons, up, and upon the garments of his sons with him, and he shall be hallowed, and his garments and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. So this is the sprinkling of the water. This is the sprinkling of the oil, a type of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the sprinkling, the cleansing water, uh, that is, are also types uh, of the blood of Christ that are being uh, that's going to be shed to ratify the new covenant that Israel is entering into. This is the generation that is going to be led by their Messiah into the, through the tribulation period and into the kingdom. And so as a nation of priests that God's going to use for salvation to go out to the rest of the nations, through the nation of Israel, they're being ceremonially sanctified, hallowed, consecrated for their priestly office. Now, I've done studies, and, and you, you know, we don't have time this morning to go into it, but the word priest is not mentioned in Paul's epistles. So we're not the holy priesthood. We're not the chosen generation. We are chosen as believers, but there's only one group of people that's called the priesthood here, and that's this group of the little flock of believers that are be go going to be, go through the tribulation period purified and go into the kingdom with the Lord, the believing remnant of Israel. Now, if you go to Ezekiel 36, what, what, why is it significant with the new covenant about this baptism? Ezekiel 36 uh, tells you in verse 24, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into, into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. There's your water baptism that John was doing. That's that sprinkling and cleansing of water under the new covenant. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit, spirit will I put within you, and will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. He's got, the Lord's going to baptize them with the Holy Spirit. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them and you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I will be your God and I will save you from all your uncleanness and I will call for the corn and will, will increase it and lay no famine upon you. Uh, verse 33, thus saith the Lord God in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities will I cause you to dwell in the cities and the way shall be builded. So it's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that washes them from their sins. If you go to Matthew chapter 1, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 1, we're going to close with this verse in Revelation chapter 1. And verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of God and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So that's what the true cleansing is. The water couldn't take away their sins. The water was a type of the washing of water by the word, the faith in the gospel of the kingdom, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and it's his blood shed at Calvary that makes them purified and able to receive everlasting life in the land promised to them through their father Abraham. We'll close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that we could study your word. We thank you for your word always explains what it's revealing, and if not in just one verse, but usually multiple verses. And there's, there's a lot of clarity when we study your word uh, rightly divided. And, and Paul says, consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding in all things. And we have that understanding, recognizing that we are not the spiritual Israel, uh, the Israel of God. We are the church, the body of Christ. And you want us to rightly divide the programs and understand which program is our program for obedience of faith and this dispensation of grace. And we thank you for these things in Christ's name. Amen.